On behalf of the Badminton Pan American Confederation, we warmly welcome you to our Coach Corner program. My name is Richard Wong, and it's my pleasure to be today's moderator. In today's session, we are pleased to have one of the world's leading badminton researchers. I'm referring to Professor Martin Falström from Sweden, who today will speak to us on this important topic, tendon injuries in badminton, the role of eccentric training in prevention and rehab. Before handing over the floor to our guests, please allow me to tell you a little bit about Dr. Falström. He's a senior consultant and head of department at the Rehabilitation Medicine Clinic in the University Hospital of Northern Sweden, Umeå, since 1993. He has a PhD in sports medicine, Umeå University, thesis, Badminton and the Achilles Tendon, 2001. He's a professor in development at the medical facility, Umeå University, 2018. Good night, Dr. Falström, and welcome to our program. Thank you for joining our audience and receiving us from your home in Umeå, Sweden. We invite you to take control and share your screen. Thank you very much, Rick, Richard. I hope uh, you can hear me. Uh, I will uh, share my screen and see if it works. So, is it okay? Yep, we're hearing you fine and your screen is shared. You can continue yeah. now. The floor I'm is yours. Happy. I'm very happy to uh, be a part of this seminar series uh, once again. Um, uh, it's a pleasure for me, and I would like. I'm very happy to share uh, what is known and what is not known about badminton injuries and badminton, the medical consequences of and prevention of badminton uh, medical problems in badminton. Tonight, I'm going to talk about tendon injuries and especially the role of eccentric training in prevention and rehab. And uh, first, I would like to tell you who I am. I would thank you for the presentation. I was, when I was young, I was playing a competitive badminton. I started working with BWF uh, in 1995 as an on court doctor. And uh, I wrote my PhD on badminton and Achilles tendon problems. And I've been continuing to work uh, with uh, BWF as on court doctor, parallel with my uh, work at the University of Umeå, Sweden. I have a picture of the Northern Light outside the campus area. And also since uh, the beginning of uh, 2024, I have been appointed as so-called semi-professional doctor for BWF for 2024 to 2026. That means uh, working in competitions, international top-level competitions, also to help BWF with the rules and regulations and behavior on court for doctors. That is what to do and what not to do on court during match play. So I will be more involved in badminton uh, the next three years, and I'm very happy about that. Uh, I will talk about badminton injuries, and actually badminton is a low-risk sport. Uh, there are many different studies uh, from different parts of the world, unfortunately with different uh, uh, definitions, different uh, study groups and all that, but you can say that uh, about three injuries in 1,000 hours of playing time is the, uh, what is expected in badminton. Of course, depending on the level you play, but most of the injuries account uh, for or overuse injuries, and most often in the lower extremities. Uh, heel, uh, heel, ankle, knee, and most often the overuse, overuse injuries in badminton are described as tendinopathies or soft tissue injuries. That depends on who is uh, making the diagnosis on the injured player. And um, it, common badminton injury sites are the lower extremities, Ankle, Achilles tendon, and knee. You see, this player has a, uh, has a, a, a protection on the knee. 
also the elbow and the, and the actually should be the right shoulder in this case. Uh, and treatment of soft tissue injuries. Since we have overuse injuries, it's difficult to say when does the injury start and when, when do you have pain or do you have an injury? And that's difficult to say. And there are many different methods for treatment and rehab also uh, for pre uh, prevention of soft tissue injuries in badminton. But in this presentation, I will focus on tendinopathies and eccentric training. Where do we have tendinopathies in badminton? That is uh, the Achilles tendon. We have the patellar tendon. We have the subacromial region that is a uh, sub, uh, supraspinatus tendon that's called impingement when there is a conflict between the bones and the tendon. And also, of course, the tennis elbow should be badminton elbow, but the painful lateral uh, um, pain in the elbow. And um, all the, the common for different tendons are that they are very dense. They are made of collagen and collagen fibers that are very dense, packed together. But not only straight uh, collagen fibers, fibers, there are also uh, so-called uh, cross fibers, and uh, they are uh, crossed and they are linked over each other, and that makes the tendon very firm, but also a bit elastic. Not uh, very, it's tense, but it's also a bit elastic, and that's important to uh, remember. And there are layers from the collagen fibril to fibers to bundles to secondary bundles, tertiary bundles, and the tendon that is covered by a layer called the epitendon. And then, of course, around the tendons are other structures, bursa, that is uh, a kind of protection pads that uh, 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 lies between the, they lie between the tendon and the, and the joint, for example, to make the tendon go better uh, and, and sit better. When the tendon is uh, in rest, it's a bit, a bit, a bit elastic, and the fibers look like this. But as soon as you start to stretch the tendon, when the muscle contracts, the tendon will be more uh, dense, and there are, uh, you see, as in this curve, there are physiological uh, elasticity in the tendon, but when it comes to more and more forces, you have a risk of overuse injury, and if you have a very high tension on the tendon, if there's a risk, it will be an acute rupture, whole rupture or partial rupture. And that is, of course, different in different persons. Uh, and since the tendons do not grow the same way as muscles do when you start training, the muscles can grow very quickly and get bigger and stronger. But the tendons are much, much, much slower in the metabolism. So it takes much longer time for the tendons to adjust to stronger muscles and that means there is always a risk of overuse injury. Um, that's the old rule. If you train too much too soon, there is always a risk for overuse injury. And the tendons are often uh, the, the structure that uh, gives you the symptoms. The typical on, uh, symptoms and findings when you have a tendinopathy, that is a gradual onset. Uh, pain, stiffness, especially in the morning when you, when you go up from bed, you feel stiff. And for example, the, the Achilles tendon, you have a decreased function. It could be, you could uh, notice swelling and you have pain when you, when you palpate the area. And 
most often you can uh, uh, get the diagnosis only by typical symptoms and findings, but there are also typical findings on ultrasonography or MRI. Ultrasonography in the hands of an experienced uh, doctor is uh, very good and much cheaper and could be used much quicker than MRI. That is also a good way to examine the tendons, but ultrasonography in, in the right hands is very cheap and very useful. There are also other structures nearby. There are ligaments, there are those bursa and the joints, of course, that might be involved in this uh, painful situation. And sometimes the tendinopathy starts with more or less acute overload and an initial inflammation. That means that it gives longer, uh, other long-term pathological processes in the tendon, and that is called tendinosis. So in the chronic or long-term cases, there are hardly no inflammation. Not, there are other uh, chemical processes in and around the tendon that gives the pain, the swelling, and the decreased function. So in the acute phase, it can be inflammation and uh, sometimes uh, pharmacological treatment with anti-inflammatory drugs can be used for, but in the long-term cases, there is no use for uh, anti-inflammatory drugs. This is an uh, ultrasonography uh, picture of an Achilles tendon. The, the upper picture shows um, a young man, uh, he's going to uh, um, play in badminton for one hour. This is before, and you can see the structure. There are tendons, uh, the fi uh, fibers are dense and packed and parallel. We have one, when we put on the color doppler, we can see one little signal here um, indicating a little more flow, blood flow, but normally you don't see blood flow in the tendon because their fibers are so dense, packed. <laughs> After one hour training, uh, the, the player has pain in the Achilles tendon, and here you can see some more um, color uh, patches indicating blood flow, and blood flow in this case is an indication of uh, uh, a pathological process and pain. And you might also see that this area here is not so uh, linear and parallel. It's a, a little bit uh, shady and um, you can see uh, like holes or echo, echo. It's not white, it's black and there are holes in the tendon. And that is probably uh, the area for a tendinosis. Tendinopathy. Here we have another example of uh, here's a, a normal tendon, and here we have a, ten, uh, a normal tendon, and here we have a tendon with big black areas indicating that the structure is not okay in the tendon. We can also see these areas with uh, much blood flow indicating that. Uh, the tendon is not in a good condition. In this case, you can also see it's not the same person, but this is the normal distance, and this is wider, this distance of the tendon. So it's swollen, and it contains black echo. Um, there are uh, hypoechoic uh, areas in this tendon indicating a pathological process. Here we have a patellar tendon, and uh, we can also see here, this is the normal tendon, nice uh, structure like this, uh, without and with color Doppler. And here you see this area, you see it's like holes in the tendon here. And when we put on the color Doppler, we can see the flow from the vessels. And that flow is not normal, should not be seen, that indication of uh, something pathological in the tendon. Uh, there is one mistake you can do when you examine uh, with ultra, uh, ultrasonography and color doppler. 
And that is to distinguish between this called tendinopathy and ruptures. And as I said in a previous uh, uh, slide, when you come to an acute pain in the tendon, I can go back a few pictures. The typical sym symptoms are gradual onset, not acute onset. If you have an acute onset of pain in the tendon, it might be a tear. And that is uh, a different handling uh, apart from uh, the overuse uh, problems with the tendon. In this case, it looks a bit similar, but you can see black areas in the tendon, and that's a tendon tear. Also here is a tendon tear on uh, and that could be a difficult for an unexperienced person, uh, therapist, to see on ultrasonography. So it means it, it needs training, 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 and training to see and make sure that it's uh, you can distinguish between uh, tendon rupture, partial tendon rupture, and tendinosis. This is important because the treatment is quite different between acute. Uh, partial rupture and uh, tendinopathy or tendinosis. Uh, itis in the tendon in Latin is, uh, is uh, uh, the tendon, uh, itis means inflammation, osis means pathological process in this case. And in the acute tendonitis, it's most often the structures around so that surround the tendon that gives the pain and irritation, inflammation, micro tears, swelling, aches, and that could be a more or less acute overuse. And that is in the, those cases, uh, it's not an acute pain onset of pain, but it comes after, for example. Uh, a weekend with a uh, uh, competition, and after the weekend, five or six matches, you get pain in the tendon. While tendinosis is more long term um, development of broken uh, collagen proteins, stiffness, decreased function, and it's a repetitive stress that means the it, it, the tendon is not given a chance to heal in a proper way. So we stop there for a break. Thank you. Uh, the eccentric training uh, is what we have been uh, developed uh, training programs in at my university for about 25 years. And actually, it all started with uh, one of my colleagues. Um, it has been described earlier, but in this uh, version that we are using, uh, it was actually one of my colleagues who got Achilles tendon pain uh, in the middle of the 90s. He was an orthopedic, he's an orthopedic surgeon working in a sports medicine clinic, the same where I've been working. And uh, by that time, uh, everyone was uh, thinking that if you get pain in your Achilles tendon, uh, it will it will snap. So if you get pain, stop loading the tendon, and otherwise it will snap. Uh, there are other studies later that have shown that um, only fifty percent of people of players getting Achilles tendon ruptures have had previous symptoms. So in 85% of the cases, there are no previous symptoms before the Achilles tendon snaps. However, my colleague wanted to be, uh, he wanted to do surgery uh, on his painful Achilles tendon. And by that time, they were doing quite a large uh, excisions. They took away a lot of the, the substance in the tendons. It took many months to get back the recovery and rehab. But my colleague wanted to be, um, wanted the, the big man, the boss, to do the surgery. And the boss said, no, no, I need you working. I cannot give you, um, I will not uh, treat you with surgery. So my friend, my colleague, he said, okay, I will train and train and train till it snaps. 
So we started very uh, tough, uh, eccentric, uh, painful training. And uh, after a while, after a few weeks, he noticed that the pain it, uh, went away and, uh, at, uh, and he started to feel much better in his tendon. The first days, the pain got worse and he said, okay, soon it will snap. But after a few weeks, he noticed that it's getting better and better. And then they started with a pilot study. They compared eccentric and concentric training in Achilles tendon uh, uh, pain. And uh, they showed, they could see that there were quite big differences that the persons doing concentric training, they still had the pain and they even got more pain while the eccentric group uh, got after some weeks, they got less pain. And uh, uh, later on, the pain uh, was uh, getting better and better. And concentric training is while uh, the muscle shortens during the loading, while eccentric training is while when the muscle lengthens during the loading. You can compare, and most often you are stronger in eccentric than in a concentric training. You can uh, think of when you stretch your arms up and try to lift yourself up. And once you are there, you can uh, go down with only one hand. And that is, you have more power in the centric loading than you have in the concentric loading. And the tendinopathies in badminton, as I said before, the Achilles tendon, the patellar tendon, the um, supraspinatus tendon, and also the um, ex extensors of the, um, of the wrist. There are, uh, the regimen is about the same, but I will show you the positions that in Achilles tendon eccentric training, you stand uh, when you have pain in the middle of the tendon. That means three, two, three, five centimeters over the the insertion. Uh, I can show it's a, when you have the pain here. You do the eccentric training with uh, you. You stand and uh, push yourself up. Uh, on a toe position and then go down and then uh, it's not so it's not so big picture you should uh, you you push yourself up with both feet so you stand you come to this position and then you take away one foot and slowly go down on the bad foot and you do it with slightly flexion flexion in the knee, and you do the same thing uh, also in uh, just as many reps with a, uh, with a knee straight, uh, stretched straight. And that is because you have three different portions of the, um, of the muscle, calf muscle that goes, they all go together and twist uh, together in the Achilles tendon. When you have, you should have painful training. That means that uh, it should hurt when you do the loading. And that means if you don't feel pain, when you lose your body weight, you can use a backpack and load it with, with weights and then get the same effect. It should hurt when you do it. When you have pain in the insertion, insertional area, that means right over the heel bone, it's better to use not to stretch uh, and in the stretch in this position, but just to go down in the 90 degree position. And that will have uh, a good help. This one, when you have pain in the middle of the Achilles tendon, you have up to 90% good effect of uh, this kind of training. While this is a little more difficult, uh, about 30 to 50 percent effect of this kind of training, but you shouldn't end in the position with uh, you shouldn't stand on a, on a stair or so, you should stand flat on the floor. I hope you understand how I mean.
the patellar tendon is uh, the same principle that you should uh, push yourself up with both uh, feet, both knees, and then go down on one on the bad knee. And it could be a little problematic to have the balance. And my own uh, experience, this is my, my colleague, but my own experience is that you have the best effect if you stand against the wall and then go down. If you stand on against the wall, you will have the correct position. And you should also have a little uh, heel pad about 30, 30 degrees. That gives a better effect. But push up on both feet, go down on the on the bad or the painful uh, side. Uh, this is some, and, and these two regiments have been, uh, there's, there's good evidence that they work. And when you read in the scientific literature, you find that different researchers have added other, uh, other treatments also. They have had the uh, ultrasound, or they have uh, ice or heat or whatever. We have always done it in a straight way without anything extra. We just do the eccentric training and it works. It, there might be other effects by other kinds of uh, additive, train, uh, additive uh, treatment, but uh, this, this uh, uh, regimen works in these two uh, Achilles tendon and patellar tendon uh, tendinosis. This is uh, something we have tried on a, a pilot study that shows um, positive effects. And this is when you have impingement. And that is in older players, most often due to atrosis in the shoulder. And in younger players, most often due to over, over um, too much mobility in the shoulder. And here we use um, a special equipment that is most often used on persons with rheumatological problem that you want to just help them to uh, 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 get a better range of motion in the shoulder. So this uh, pad here is lifting the bad arm up to the horizontal position and then the, the lets, lets the arm go down with the arm of the arm as a weight. But then in this, to get it painful, he's using a weight holding it in his hand, but he's lifting the arm up with his hand, letting it down by itself. Uh, when we did the pilot study on this uh, treatment or this uh, rehab training, we found also that many persons had other pathological problems here. They had the bursa was uh, painful, and also um, uh, sometimes the acrom uh, acromioclavicular joint, but uh, still the, 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 this training worked, uh, even though we didn't have the exactly correct. Uh, it's worth try My message is that it is worth trying. Then uh, when it comes to tennis elbow, it's not so well documented. And there's a problem because the uh, Tendons, the muscles and tendons, they cause two joints, this joint and this joint. But the principle is the same. You sit with the, the elbow and an easy flexion. You have a weight in your hand, the painful uh, arm, and then you lift it with the, with the other hand and let it down and lift it again and let it down. So you get only the eccentric contraction. And the regimen we have used is 15 reps three times after each other, and we do it twice a day. And you hear 12 weeks, that is the basic evidence-based training program, 12 weeks. And that is a very long time when it hurts when you are training, but after, usually it takes seven to 12 days when you have a little more pain, but then after about two weeks, you are getting better and better and better. 
And our experience is that you have to support the player or the patient in this, uh, help them more, uh, uh, help them to motivate them to keep on the training so they don't give up. And what we saw in the large first study we did was that people with training experience had much better results than people without training experience. And that means people without training experience, they gave up easier and couldn't continue with the training. When it comes to badminton players, I think it's not a problem to uh, motivate them to do something for the Achilles tendon or shoulder problems. So, but they need support and they need to have uh, someone coaching them to see that they are doing the motions right. The loading should be painful, so you use uh, weights, backpack or weights. And when it comes to sports-related uh, rehabilitation and prevention, my opinion is that the training regimen should be individualized. <laughs> the basic regimen is what we have been writing papers about. So this is the evidence-based uh, training regimen. But when it comes to more or less uh, severe problems, also prevention, uh, I have players doing this training twice a week and have good effects as preventive, uh, preventive training. The day before, they will play badminton. The day after, they play badminton. They do this eccentric training, and that's all. So it's a, the dose is uh, the dose is uh, should be individualized in the practical use, but the evidence is shown for only the what they call it, the tough training, 12-week training. Um, what's the problem? What could happen? What can go wrong? Of course, uh, bad compliance. It hurts more and more in the beginning. That then the patient will not continue with training. Uh, if they don't do the uh, training uh, in the correct way, there will be no effect. But the, uh, the worst is if you have a rupture. So if you have a player with acute onset of tendon pain, you should not uh, recommend eccentric training. You should uh, make sure that the player get a good diagnosis. Most often it takes ultrasonography or MRI to give, get the uh, correct diagnosis. If the correct diagnosis is correct, there are no serious side effects. And as I said, mentioned before, it could be effective even when there is other pathology. And it could always be worth trying, even though you don't, you are not 100% sure that it's all the pain comes from the tendon and not from the ligament or from vice versa. You can always try it. What happens when you do the eccentric training? Yeah, we don't know. We don't know exactly. Because, as I said, mentioned before, the metabolic turnover in tendons are slower compared to muscles. And uh, when things happen in the tendons, it doesn't happen so fast as in the muscles. So, but something has happened, and the swelling is slowly and slowly getting uh, down. So, after weeks and months of this training or healing of the tendon, the tendon comes down from being swollen to being more normal in the structure, also in the blood flow and or in the diameter. Uh, we can see that with long time, long term follow up, that the, the tendon gets normalized when the pain goes down, and after a year, it's difficult to distinguish the damaged uh, tendon from the normal tendon. And what is really happening within the tendon, we don't know. Probably a difference in the collagen formation, but the tendon structure is normalized. It's less swelling and the pain, will be, there will be a pain. You can read about this eccentric training in uh, this, this uh, pad who was in the picture. Uh, uh, I was in some of the pictures, but he's 
This uh, is his thesis he, he defended in 2009. And in this uh, thesis, you don't have to have the book. You can look at the website and go into the University of Umeå, the website, and get the full text and where he describes exactly the, the uh, uh, eccentric training regimen. regimen. And he has examined all these, uh, three of these uh, tendons, uh, the shoulder, the Achilles tendon, and the patella tendon. Not the, uh, not the eccentric training in uh, tennis elbow, but the other three locations he has described in this, in this book or in this text that you can uh, download. So, I quit there and wait for uh, questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Falstrom. We now move into our question and answer section. Please, if you have any questions, write them in the chat box uh, located at the bottom of your screens. Okay, let's check the chat to see. I should say again that I recommend you, of course, I couldn't uh, show and describe, but uh, the link I, I, I gave you is uh, it's how to do it. It's very well uh, described in this in this uh, uh, on this side on this book if you want to know more and if you want to practice. Uh, I think that one of the key things is that uh, you should try to isolate the eccentric training and avoid the concentric training when you do the regimen. That's one thing. And the other thing is that it should be uh, painful. And I've been, uh, in these uh, studies we have published, I've had about 165 patients uh, with this problem in the Achilles tendon, we have had we haven't had one single person that is getting uh, an a rupture. So no one is less. You know, what I learned when I was playing badminton many years ago on a competitive level, they said if you get pain, the, the tendon will snap. But we haven't seen any of our patients uh, having acute snap the tendons while doing this painful training. Okay. We have a quick uh, we have a question from Crystal here and she's asking can water slash fluids build up in, in the tendons? If so, how is it treated? Well yeah um, I mean the tendons are uh, they are made from, I mean, in, the tendons are made from the collagen fibers, but also uh, the, uh, what's called the, um, uh, uh, like, uh, uh, matrix, as a surrounding matrix that is uh, water. There are, there is water in the tendons, and the water is, uh, when the tendon is swelling, there is more water. But it's and also you can see a more uh, blood flow uh, in the tendons. Usually, when you do ultrasonography, you don't see the blood flow in the tendons. But in these swollen um, tendons, uh, you have more matrix, more what you call it, dead space between the collagen fibers, and this matrix is very rich of water and other and, uh, uh, proteoglucans, it's um, like sugar, sugar molecules. So the water, uh, what should I say, uh, there is water in the tendons. There is a lot of water in the tendons, but uh, the, the important thing is that you have the, the collagen fibers I, I don't know if that was, uh, uh, I could answer your question, Christian. Well, is, is there a problem with excess water in, being in the tendons, I guess is a question. And if there is excess water, how do we treat it? 
No, I don't think that you can do anything about excess water within the tendons, but most the, quite often you have there could be a small uh, more water around surrounding the tendons, and also uh, surrounding the tendons is the paratendon. That's the uh, outer layer. And there you can get more water, more swelling, more pain. And that's the more acute situation with, with inflammation. And there, of course, I guess you can find more fluids that could be uh, treated with, for example, uh, anti-inflammatory drugs, uh, perhaps other kind of physical treatment also, uh, uh, ice, could be perhaps useful, but uh, or pressure or but concerning the long term cases, there is no inflammation within the tendon, but there could be inflammation outside the tendon and in the structures around. I hope that will yeah answer the question. Okay, she... I see your comment. <laughs> okay, excellent. There are, there are more than one. There are more than one structure that can cause the pain, and I mean, since the pain, all the structures as, uh, in the shoulder and the tendon, Achilles tendon area are very close together, so it could be very difficult to distinguish uh, between from one uh, uh, pathology to it another. But what I am very will warn you about that is giving cortisone injections in these cases in the Achilles tendon. So that is not uh, a, a drug of choice to give cortisone injections. And you can't give cortisone injections within a tendon. It's impossible. Uh, you can give in the surrounding area, but it's impossible to get a, a shot within the tendon. And it could... Uh, be a problem with the, the tendon structure it gets even worse so you can have an Achilles tendon rupture so beware of Achilles uh, of cortisone injections in the Achilles tendon area okay and Adrian says thank you very much for your your presentation is very interesting what is your opinion on performing compensatory exercises to seek body symmetry at the end of the session <sighs> I think uh, you mean uh, to. I, I think one problem we have in badminton is that is that we play, we have asymmetric training. Uh, if if that's what you mean, because we have. I, I believe that's what he means. Yes. Yeah, and uh, uh, because uh, I think it's important. We discussed it in one previous session, but but uh, then. We have seen in especially in young players that play uh, that play a lot of badminton but don't uh, do regular uh, uh, symmetric strength training and so that they get imbalance especially in the shoulder that they have imbalance in the strength of the internal and external rotators so i recommend uh, most players to do more general symmetric training and not only badminton because you have to have symmetric training to avoid uh, body imbalance and uh, what you can see uh, many many years ago in some of the players you can see so much difference for example between the legs the diameter of the legs they had the right the right-handed players had a right leg that was so thick and the left one was not because they were only training, practicing badminton, badminton, badminton. Mm -hmm. I think we are much wiser today and we should do symmetric training, perhaps uh, in connection with the ordinary uh, badminton uh, training session or rest from badminton once or twice a week and do other training. Um, Belly, shoulders, legs, do symmetric training, general physical training. Okay, I guess that kind of ties in because the, the next question is, are there any additional strategies and interventions that complement eccentric training in preventing or rehabilitating tendon injuries in badminton players? 
Uh, I mentioned that the other uh, researchers have tried different regimens, and uh, I think that uh, that depends on that depends on uh, what which tendon. I think that uh, when it comes to uh, when it comes to patellar tendon, when it comes to uh, tennis elbow, when it comes to Achille, Achilles and patella tendon, it's important to do stretching when you are warm, and uh, even as a prevention measure, uh, as a preventive measure to do stretching so to make sure you have good uh, move, a uh, good uh, range of, mo of motion in your in your joints. I think there's one problem with the shoulder, and I see sometimes. Uh, the trainers and coaches stretching and stretching and stretching the shoulders of the uh, players. And that is a little problematic because if you have a very high range of movement in the shoulder, you must have very good muscular control. In many young players, they get impingement problems because they are too, uh, they have too much uh, range of movement, no stability in the joint. I am an old player. I have that. I don't have that problem because I'm stiff and get more and more stiff. But in the younger players, sometimes they have too much movement and too less uh, muscular control. So, I guess when it comes to shoulders, I sh I think you should, uh, as a preventive measure, you should train and have good uh, muscular control in the shoulder. In the in the bigger uh, in the knee in the uh, Achilles and also in the uh, that went concerning tennis elbow you should use stretching or just to make sure you have a good um, you, you can compare with the other side make sure you have the same range of motion in both sides if that's a answer if that's a, an answer to the question <laughs> okay yeah I think that's that answers the question. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Falström, for sharing such an interesting presentation with us. It has been very enriching talking with you and to analyze the different situations that are occurring in our sport. We encourage you to write to us and make proposals of topics you are interested in. Also, we invite you to check out BPAC's YouTube channel, where you can see this and other conferences we've held. Before closing today's webinar, we greet all our audience that have accompanied us today, and in a special way, the following persons. We have Fabian from Argentina, Gloria from Barbados, Karina from Brazil, Elliot from Canada, Jose and Sofia from Colombia, Randy, Jesley, Brenda, and Adrian from Costa Rica, quite a large contingent there. Jose from Cuba, Rene and Andres from El Salvador, Alex and Juan from Guatemala, Crystal from Jamaica, Vladimir from Mexico, Franklin and Walter from Peru, Gigliola from Venezuela, Antoine from Senegal, and Velan, Velan Janhari from Madagascar. On behalf of Badminton Pan America, we thank you for your participation, and we hope that you enjoyed today's session. Stay well and stay safe.